Dennis Lamont is an avid historian of the inner urbans that passed through Vermilion. He is co-author of the Acadia book, Lakeshore Electric Railway. Since this um, program is being videotaped, please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate and we will hold the questions until the end of the program and you'll be able to have a chance to ask them if you'd like. And I'd like to welcome Dennis Lamont. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Good. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we're going to do a little exploration of history. We're going to look at footprints, the footprints of a bygone era, namely that of the interurbans. First, to get you a little bit oriented, a little bit of safety. This is Cleveland Public Square in 1947, the last big year for streetcars in Cleveland. Rush hour when everybody worked downtown was going home. As you can see, you had to be agile in those days if you're going to be a successful pedestrian in Cleveland or you'd lose it. They were moving thousands of people all over the city. This is the west side and the rush. This is the east side going out Euclid Avenue, one of the heaviest traveled streetcar lines in the country. The car you see heading out is going to my old home in Cleveland Heights. The one coming back is coming back from Euclid. It's one of the big articulated double streetcars packed to the gills, bringing people in and out. The next step up in the electric railway hierarchy was the inurbans, the inner city electric cars. Bigger, faster, more comfortable. The local one here, Lakeshore Electric Railway, between Cleveland and Detroit, was a very fast line. Here we are zipping through Bay Village. This is now Electric Boulevard in Bay Village, back when it was a 60 mile an hour rail corridor. This is where we're going to be traveling tonight. Next up is the Columbus, Delaware, and Marion. Between those cities, for a lot of years, it was the connection to Cleveland. They would start out from the interurban station in Columbus, right downtown. And this great 60-foot long car, you have to imagine it painted red and white. How's that? Can you see that better? Because the quality usually isn't that good. These are kind of old, and we love them, but uh, I wish the quality was better. They headed right out through the traffic down the streetcar lines. This is Big Darby Creek on Route 23, just north of Columbus. It's now a shopping mall, continuous shopping mall. But the interurbans in those days would cruise down there at 60 plus miles an hour in these big cars all on their own right away, up over the railroads rather than cross them at grade. That held them up and caused a lot of problems. But here we are flying along. By coincidence, both these railroads are now woods. But here's an interurban flying across rural Ohio on its way up to Delaware and up to Marion to make connections. Next up on the speed list and modern uh, interurban was the Cincinnati and Lake Erie. It's now Interstate 75 between Toledo and Cincinnati. They built a set of special cars built to cruise at 90 miles an hour. See this car race an airplane. Took them a while, but they found an airplane that was slow enough. You see it up there. It's a World War I SPAD, and she's cruising along right at 90. Motorcycles, race cars, and an interurban car. This was a special run for the movies. They spiked all the switches, blocked all the crossings, and just flew. This lasted until 1938 also. This was the fastest and most modern, and it didn't quite make it past the automobile age. Let's see if I can get this right. <laughs> okay. Paid political announcement. The collection of stuff that you're going to see tonight is a lot of stuff our family has collected, including interurban cars, nuts and bolts, bits and pieces of history, a vast digital collection, over 100,000 pictures. This is going to be moved over to Stop 65 Beach Park Station over in Avon Lake across from the power plant. This was the original 1897 Lorraine Cleveland Car Barn, 
and we're going to put our collection over there. When it's done, it'll be open to the public, available on the internet. We'll have a complete genealogical history, as far as we know, and it keeps growing, of the employees of the Lakeshore Electric. What they did during the, on the railroad, what they did after where their families are. So you'll be able to add to that or look it up. And it's been a lot of fun pulling that up because you, be, you wouldn't believe who worked for the railroad in those days. Of course, this is the Lakeshore Electric Railway. This is a motorman's button. Conductor's button on their fancy uniform. Here's a list of the historical societies, including archival, that we have to thank for contributing and sharing. And I might add, if you have anything to contribute or share, go through archival. They'll scan it, give it back to you. If you don't know the history, we can look all that up, find out the history for you, what it is in the picture, and get it back to you. Thanks to Rich Tarrant and his family, they've been around for a million for a lot of years. They collected a lot of stuff, and they're sharing it with everybody. And it's a great place to visit on the internet, the print museum, or archival. Our two websites, the Lakeshore Electric Rail Maps and Brady's Lorraine County Nostalgia, places to look for history and electric railway, nonsense, old history, and a lot of fun to tour. The footprints the Lakeshore Electric left are all over Vermilion. Over here in the river by the Lakeshore Electric Park, the two tracks that came across to the old Lakeshore Electric Bridge and up through the marina. Here's another view, switching it around. You can see the curve of the track, and I think it's still there, but the last time I was there, there's a rail with a, with a cable across it. And those two pieces of rail look like they came from the Lakeshore Electric. So that's another souvenir you can put your hand on. The plaque gives you the information about the bridge at the park over there. It's a nice place to watch trains or just spend a day, a couple hours, looking at the wonderful scenery. Mr. F.W. Cohn, the great Mr. Lakeshore Electric, as they call him, single-handedly held the thing together through thick and thin, all the way up to the end. And he managed to keep the employees that were qualified employed long enough to get railroad retirement. So instead of getting thrown out on their ear in 1938, the majority of them either went to work on his bus line or got railroad retirement. Cohen Road is named after his family. His brother, Ed, was the banker in town here. Whoop. I, it's very sensitive. Another good and very solid reminder of the Lakeshore Electric is the substation. This is where they converted high tension AC into voltage of 600 volts DC to run the trolleys. They also had the downstep transformers that ran the lights in Vermilion and generally caused chaos when a car had come through. Big three car train, stop at the station downtown He'd start up, and there were 12 140-horse electric motors drawing all the current they could to get up that hill, and all the lights in town would dim. Everybody would shake a fist at the railroad, and they'd be, they'd be on their way. The time machine will turn it back, and this is one of the pictures of the operation as it was known in town. You can always tell the inurban station, because here's a penny scale. Can you see the pointer? Is that coming up? There's a penny scale at every inner urban station. They got a cut of the penny, and you got to check your weight. Here's a cream container. These weren't milk cans. These were cream cans. It turned out it wasn't economical to ship milk. Milk was bulky. You could skim the cream off the top, put it in a little container. They'd ship it into Cleveland, add water to it, and sell it as milk again. So that, that is what they pushed, and they saved a lot of money and shipping space. Over here on the baggage wagon, believe it or not, that's three boxes of Kishman fish. Kishman was the only fishery on the lake that didn't use barrels. They did ship some, but most of it went in boxes. Easy to handle, and these were just fresh fish out of the lake that morning, an hour away from a restaurant in Cleveland. That took a while after the interments quit to start that again. 
Inside these big rotary converters, the AC would go in one end and the DC would come out the other and it would run the trolley cars. One of the remnants, and we got to show this because it's a constantly changing list if you've never seen it, when the line went out of business, they took the line all to three locations, Sandusky, Fremont, and Toledo, and scrapped everything. The cars they took apart, took anything off that was scrappable, and sold the bodies for sheds, cottages, and everything else that you could use a building like that for. There were so many of these things, and they got to be such a pain that the zoning committees put rules against, the, against having these things on your property <laughs> after a while. So if, they, if you ever tried to put them on again, you couldn't. But these things were scattered all over. They lasted for a long time. They have a history in themselves, which we're digging up. And if you know anything about them, feel free to join in and provide more information. But there's a list. If we run through it quick, we never did figure out where this one went. Number 26 shows coming to Vermilion. It disappeared back in the woods someplace. This one we're quite familiar with. This is 39 that was down at the uh, riverside as Parson, Parsons Fishery Supplies and stuff. This is number 35 as it looked like. This is what the cars looked like when they were running. They also had, down by the river, the two piggyback trailers. There were actually three on a car, but two of them were down there. And this was the first attempt at piggyback in the area, and it happened on the interurbans. And if it would have worked, it really would have been neat, but the state put them out of business because, believe it or not, they could run an interurban line. I could go down to the license bureau and get a truck license. They couldn't. I could haul anything anywhere, and the Lakeshore Electric couldn't. So they went out of business. They went out of the trucking business. Here's what they looked like loaded up, three trailers, and these would be uh, taken to a destination, and all it really needed was two planks alongside the track, and a, uh, a tractor would pull up and pull off your particular box and take it to your location and so forth. But this is the first piggyback they had. Here it is in action, coming off the ramp. The trailers are off, there's the ramp, and the Lakeshore would deliver any place, any time, just to get the business, which they badly needed. Unfortunately, this was 1969, everything got flooded. The cars all got moved out and everything. We know where this one went. We think we know where the trailers went, but we're not really sure. Vermilion Fishing Game, for many, many years, this car sat there. It was taken right off the trucks in Sandusky and delivered right to the club. They're the original owners, and they kept it up magnificently over the years. It was their utility shed. 2000, the friends of ours that are helping us with Stop 65 picked it up, had it picked up, hauled out. This is what it looks like now. If you visit us over at Stop 65, right on the lake across from the power plant, you see big orange number 38 is our advertisement. Later when, this is, uh, when the displays are finished, we'll be in a back building uh, with all our artifacts and items that we have collected over the years. So if you're in the neighborhood, stop by for a visit. This is what the car looked like. This is, I don't know what exact part of the stadium, but this is now under the stadium in Cleveland. <laughs> Ninth and uh, Eagle Avenue was the freight depot for many, many years until they got too busy and they moved it out. But here's the car, brand new, all lined up, ready to load freight and get out of town. 39, this ended up, we don't know, we can't identify this location, but this is the body, and it was moved later. This is what it looked like new, brand new, bright orange paint. The colors you'll see, this is the painted the same orange as the Cleveland Browns orange. The color is with us yet as a safety color. Very, sticks out like a sore thumb, quite visible, which was needed in those days. Here's one that was down right across the river from McGarvey's. This is 64, and that, believe it or not, is quite a historic car because it was involved in a near miss. This one derailed on the big old Rocky River Bridge, and this is 100 foot down to the river. 
And the only thing that kept this on, see right down here, that little seven-eighths of an inch lip of steel on the wheel caught on a rail and jammed. After everybody quit screaming, they got off the back door okay, called the dispatcher and got the wrecking car out there, but she was brought back and uh, lived for a while in Vermilion. This one was the dinky. This, if you've ever been to Berries in Norwalk, the bar, the dinky, this is the dinky. <laughs> That's an actual picture of the dinky, number 115 in Norwalk. There's a, we got a million pictures of this. The town loved it. They made it their monument, but it was scrapped like the rest of the cars. And we don't have any idea. We're supposed to come to Vermilion area. We don't know where it went. It'd be fun to find that. Here's one Dan Brady dug up going through the archives. We had this picture in the file for 30 years. Nice picture of a car, number 155. We knew it came to Vermilion, and we finally found it through Dan. If you remember, maybe you don't, a lot of us don't. I, I never saw it. But before the existing Lake Road here, the brand new Lake Road, at the marina on Oak Point, it used to cross, the old road used to cross the marina, go up the hill to what they call now Old Lake Road, through the woods, and then back onto Lake Road. This is where the power plants are, the older power plant and the new power plant. And there's a gas station at the corner here. And here's another view of it. There's the gas station, there's the road, and there's the car sticking out the back of that picture. So 155 was back off the road, destroyed when the power plant was built, but that's where it was. This, by the way, the Klaus farmhouse is gone now, but this is where Klaus Hill was. This was a very deep ravine, and Mr. Klaus got the nickel plate to leave a place in the trestle for his cattle to pass through to go down to the lake for a drink. He talked them into that. It turned out to be a tourist collection because this became, this area here became the western hole in the wall. You've heard of hole in the wall beach? Where people used to go fishing, well there were two of them. This was the western one out by Klaus Hill and people would get off the uh, inner urban car which ran just north of the road down to go fishing or just on the beach for a good time. And of course the beach, beach is gone, but uh, that was the old days. Number 160, the Maurer Farm uh, on the north side of town. We got some, Mr. Maurer gave us some pizzas and parts of that car before they got rid of it. And it was a very interesting car. Here she sits in Fremont. This was the funeral car that the Lakeshore Electric used to take one of their officials bodies back up to Toledo. So we feel it was pretty important. We got a piece of that thing as a remembrance, but that was out at the Maurer Farm. 166, the Queen of the Fleet. This is the one the fans like to ride. We'll see some of it in the movies, but it was a cottage over on the east side of town, right off the, uh, right off the lake road by the gas station. And they opened it a couple times for tours, and there's, we got some, fortunately we got some pictures of the inside with the fa fancy woodwork and the light fixtures, the stained glass and the big, they called this a full empire ceiling. This was all curves up in here, all wood and covered, and mahogany trim inlaid with white holly. Inside, when you were riding the car, this is what it looked like with the big plush seats. These had a flower pattern. This was the passenger compartment where the women and children rode. Up here in the smoking compartment, you had enough 12 seats for 24 people, your own personal cuspidors, so you could chew and smoke here and just have a great old time while the train went on and not bother the women and children. Here we are in front of the station in Vermilion. There's the old refreshment place, the old rest stop, Fisher's home, which is gone, but on 166, the motorman has his orders. He's supposed to pick up probably those fish boxes, take them into town, and here they just dropped off the Toledo papers. 
Every day, the Lakeshore Electric shipped paper. 600 bundles of paper from Toledo would be dropped off at all the stations. Same thing from the plane dealer and the press. That's how your papers got delivered, mainly because there weren't any roads. The interurbans ran every hour, didn't stop for anything but a major storm. One good rain and you didn't get to Cleveland. You know, the roads just weren't paved yet. This is where they made their money. Out here, I met this lady. She was a wonderful lady. She managed the olive factory. And they had the farmhouse out here at what was known as Ackerman's Curve. Here's Route 2, the old Route 2 coming into town, went right over the top of the Lakeshore Electric. But there was a curve in the line here, and it was called Ackerman's Curve because Dr. Ackerman from Elyria owned this place, and they gave place names to stops and stuff. But they got two cars, 167, which became ours, and 181, which is in Chippewa Lake. These co they were used as cottages here, and they were from 1938 till 1964. They were booked every single summer solid. They had a beautiful beach, beautiful place to go fishing. Here's what it looked like when they dropped it off. Over in Sandusky, the boys took everything off that you could get off with a screwdriver or a cutting torch and delivered the bare body. The seats were still inside because they had no scrap value. They told us how much trouble they had getting the seats out and scrapping them, and I'm crying, but they did it. They all got burned, and uh, they just aren't able to find too many like that anymore. But this was 1939. Here's what it looked like, 1995. After a little bit of work, my brother and I got it back together. We got all fixed up. We were at the 1995 Steel Plant Museum and we appeared as the longest, biggest, heaviest float the International Parade has seen to date. And believe it or not, we had 40 people riding in the car, throwing souvenirs out and everything else. We just had a ball that day and uh, really enjoyed it. But this gives you some idea what the colors were. Here we are, 181 up in Detroit. I want you to see this people catcher here. The uh, city ordinances in all the cities insisted on having something to keep people from getting tangled up underneath in the wheels. So the people catcher became an industry. Each line had its own design. This was the Lakeshore Electric, Detroit United. Cleveland used Providence fenders and uh, kept a lot of people from getting hurt because as you saw, public square was pretty crowded. Here's 181, just before they moved it as a cottage. Another view of the back. Here it is, 1924. Uh, this is on the mall in downtown Cleveland. They had a big convention, and all the interurbans contributed their latest cars, latest cars and equipment. They had just refinished this car, and they wanted to show it off for the high-speed express runs to Cleveland and Detroit. Here's another one out on West River Road, 174. We'll see her in motion, but this was the mayor home for many years. Later, they got a roof over it, uh, really had it fixed up nice. Came time to change, and it was taken down to a museum. Here we are, 174, out at Route 61 at Sealand Junction. The conductor out there talking to the other conductor, getting their couple of packages off, and they will be on their way to Toledo. Here's the car today sitting down in Newark. If you're down in Newark, you can visit it at the works where the cars were built. This is the actual factory where they were built. And you can go through the buildings and see some of the souvenirs. It's a fun place for kids, uh, a lot of displays and stuff like that. Good, good one day visit, glass blowing, uh, et cetera. But in 1897, the interurban craze was in full bore, and they started building out of Cleveland because it was a population center. Cleveland already had streetcars out to 12 miles that extended the city from 55th Street out to 105th, Lakewood, Rocky River out to the river, city limits, and the streetcar speeds were adjusted so that within that circle, you were always an hour away from Cleveland. So you could live out in what they call the streetcar suburbs have plenty of time to get to work in downtown Cleveland 
for a nice cheap fare and uh, good steady transportation. No parking place, no traffic jams. The horses got in the way, but it, it was pretty nice travel before the roads got plugged up. But here we are out to Painesville, down to Akron, over here to Elyria, and here we are at Lorraine, and there's a big empty spot, and there's Vermilion out there. Well, as it turned out, the people that built the Lorraine in Cleveland saw an infinite number of fairs coming out of Sandusky at the lakes, Lorraine building up to be a big city, so we have to, we have to connect the two cities in Sandusky and Cleveland. We have to connect them with interurbans, and the dream was to connect to Detroit. So what they ended up doing is buying the Sandusky streetcar system. They had a lot of money. <laughs> they built an interurban called the Sandusky and Interurban, and it was going to run from Sandusky to Cleveland, connect with the Lorraine and Cleveland. Same officers, same people, different printing on the stock certificates. But they built a car barn, got their cars. This, by the way, was the old, if you're familiar with Sandusky, the old giant tiger over on Columbus Avenue. Right, it's right behind the mall now, but this burned down a few years ago. But that was their 1899 car barn. Now there was a kicker. They had the big interurban cars, and here's the operating crew, and their big interurban cars. They were four times bigger and heavier than the streetcar, and people started to worry because they wanted to run down the roads, and the county commissioners had to look at each bridge before they okayed the line to travel on them. One of the biggest hang-ups they had was the city of Huron. They had a rickety old swing bridge there that just wouldn't support the weight, and they had to work around it. So they did. They ignored Huron and started building from Sealand, Route 61, everybody knows where Sealand is, and they built on into Lorraine. And at the time, it was dirt roads, and this is what the line looked like. This is the west side of Lorraine. This is West Erie Avenue in 1910, with the single track come cruising down there. And here they are, right down in the center of Lorraine. This is the loop. This is West Erie Avenue, Broadway Avenue. There's a Lorraine Cleveland car. As soon as they get that connected out west, we'll be able to go up to Sandusky, maybe, but down from Ceylon to Berlin and all the way to Detroit. 1901, now remember 1899, we're up to 1901. They got their act together, took their five pieces, glued them all together and made the Lakeshore Electric out of them. They're still not finished yet, they're still building. And this is where this fun picture comes. Everybody's seen this picture of my past shows and again, uh, Drew Penfield pulled out the newspaper articles on it, but this is 1901, and they had to take one of those little streetcars we saw because they couldn't get across the bridge in Huron. So, so they had to take a shortcut down through Milan and come bouncing across the unfinished ties and into Vermilion, and they had to stop because they didn't have the bridge finished. So they walked across the bridge, got a horse and buggy to take them in, they got a car into Lorraine, and we're done, we're done. It took about a month later and they started running, but this was the very first trip right in front of Hart's Drugstore. By the way, there's a saloon behind this picture here where they all stopped in to calm down after the run. The bridge in Huron that hung them up uh, is in a landscape that's completely unrecognizable today. This is the moonscape where they tore the mill out. This is a boarding house of ill repute. The Lakeshore Electric came down the river, crossed this swing bridge, and into town. This is where the marina is today, but this was Valentine Fries Lumberyard, and sitting behind this vessel is the largest schooner ever built on the lakes, built by Mr. Fries over in Milan. He used it for lumber storage. But that's the big hang-up in Huron. And it took them till 1903 to solve it, so Sandusky's hanging out. Meanwhile, Vermilion is getting every single train, every single hour there's an interurban going through, the freight's going through. Interurban's having a great time in Vermilion, doing a good business. 
But here's what she looked like back then, dirt roads, down Division Street to the railroad tracks. The grand total view, there's our favorite drugstore, single track on a dirt road. This building, of course, is gone, as are most of these. But that was what it looked like around before the First World War. And again, none of these roads were paved before the First World War, so you were strictly subject to the weather, two, days, two trains a day on the railroad or a train every hour on the interurban. By 1920, this network had grown. The little map we saw out of Cleveland, this was the expanse. Now we got over 5,000 miles of track. 2,800 miles of track are in Cleveland, I mean, in Ohio, covering most of the state. Every town, every city, 10,000 people or over, had an interurban line running to it. Some had several. And just to show you the effect and how these things were used, in 1910, there were 4,700,000 people in Ohio. 1920, we went up by a million, and we kept going up by a million. Now, th these 4,700,000 people in 1910 rode the interurbans 157,851,000 times. So they rode it a lot. It was a lot of traveling being done by interurban. And if you follow the years down, you can see that after the First World War, the money shifted over to automobiles, building automobiles, but the paved roads didn't catch up. So we're still 200 million, just in Ohio. And it kept going to the 20s, and then it started to drop off. 1933, 39 million people still rode. 1938, nobody rode. There weren't any more. So that was it. Flash in the pan, 1907, 1938, and the industry disappeared from history leaving behind the power companies that they started, all the pole line easements, and all the good things that came from having privately owned electric companies that we use today. The name has changed, but it's still the same electric lines and easements. No traffic jam. Traffic was already a pain in the neck, mainly because of the roads, narrow and lots of cars. But the interurbans went out of their way to rebuild the cars, and you saw these chair car seats were those big plush. The cushions were about this deep, and you had a nice, nice ride out to where you were going. The lines grew up six to uh, take you any place out of Cleveland in east, west, south, even north. You could even go north out of an urban on an interurban connected boat to London and Port Stanley on the on the Theodore Roosevelt. So you could go. Southwest, northwest, northeast, southeast, south, and out to Chardon, Gates Mills, all those places that are growing up today that the interurban was there before anybody really lived there, and uh, they were there first. If you're wondering how all this worked, this is one of the trucks pulled out from underneath the car. The wheels are standard railroad wheels, big heavy journals, forged side frames. Right here's a motor. This is about a 100 horse DC motor. It's geared down to these gears, to the uh, axle, which drives the wheel, four of these per car, and they drove the car on 600 volts DC. Inside, they looked exactly like a railroad coach, and this was the difference between an urban and a streetcar. By law, they were required to have a lavatory, water coolers, and for customer service, they had comfortable seats and luggage racks up here. You could store your packages at the end compartment to get them on your way. But there's very little difference between these and the standard railroad coach. The streetcars, on the other hand, how many people rode streetcars? Good, we have some representatives. Very few people to remember the wicker seats. But these are rattan seats, and if you were a kid in short pants in the summer, they were quite painful. <laughs> they would scratch you and really scratch you. But here, are these, these cars were built to haul people. You stood up, their standing room, packed everybody in and headed out. But this was a streetcar in Cleveland. The interurban car, when it's all dolled up, here's a view back from the smoking compartment. No standees on interurban. It's like a railroad car. You got a ticket, you got a seat. 
going back through our travel on the Lakeshore Electric, I want to start, instead of going the whole way, we're going to start out, I stretched it to Baumhart Road, okay? That okay? <laughs> because we found out some interesting things, but here's the stops. Out at Baumhart's, number one, 118, Bronze, number 119, Kishman Beach, Camp Pacoa, Loyola on the Lake, Sunnyside, Sunnyside Beach, Vermilion on the Lake, Diagonal Crossing, and Alberta Beach. Where you see a name, one of the favorite tricks of the inurban developer was to go up to a farmer like Mr. Baumhart. We would like to arrange an easement for our railroad to go over your property. We need a 40-foot easement. And this easement is for the electric railway only. And when it goes out of business, you get the land back. Well, Mr. Baumhart says, what is it, what's in it for me? What are you going to give me? He said, well, we'll put a stop there. We'll give that stop a number, and any time you want us to stop, wave a newspaper, we'll stop and pick you up. Of course, they would do that any place on a line. Any place you wave, they pick you up. But they, that's how they would sell their easements. So we'll see some of those were pretty tricky. They weren't as easy as you think. But we'll start our trip looking out the back window at full speed. Very faintly in the background, you see on this sand dune, Oak Point Hotel. This was the new lake road that cut Oak Point, which was a summer resort, right in half. But they had a hotel, bathhouse, several buildings there in addition to the uh, marina there. So that got destroyed there. But that's where we'll start our trip, looking out the back window. Over here at Baumhart's, stop 118, Bronze 119. I didn't know this until Dan... Brady dug it up, but this was where the founder of Brownhelm Township, Judge Brown, had his home. And this home was there, this huge home was there from the founding of Brownhelm Township to the building of the Ford plant. It was owned first by Judge Brown, then the Baumharts, then the Emricks. But here's the picture with the Ford plant. Here's Baumhart Road, there's the judge's house, and there's the inurban line, right in his backyard. So anytime he wanted to ride, he'd just go wave his newspaper and he could get his ride. But now today, this is all paved over. This is where the crossover bridge is at the Ford Motor Camp. Ford Motor Company, uh, former parking lot, now junkyard. But that was the Brown House, Judge Brown's home. Stop 122, Kishman's Beach. Stop 123, Camp Hakoa at uh, Helen Drive. Looks like this today, it's still the power company right away, and they keep it uh, brush clean so they can get a truck down and for maintenance. But Camp Hakoa was Johnny Kilbane. Johnny was a boxer, lightweight champion of the world. He built a training camp out here. Later, when that stopped, they built a camp for Jewish boys out at Camp Annis Field they had a camp for Jewish girls. Because the Jewish people were not welcome along Lake Erie, so to solve that problem for at least their children, they developed these two camps for the boys and the girls. And any place on the system, you could go into a station and buy a ticket for your child and put them on the train, and the conductor would make sure they got off at Camp Annis Field or Camp Hakoa. So that lasted for many years. Uh, part of it, these two buildings are still left. Looks like this today, this center portion burned down not too many years ago, but the guy that wrote the Lakeshore Electric book, that compiled the last Lake, Lakeshore Electric book's uncle ran this place. And the Lakeshore ran right here, and as a kid, he was bored to tears, and he'd just sit right against that building and watch the cars go by. That's how he spent his summers, because his uncle wouldn't take him any place else. Here's a picture of young John in his prime, and it's hard to believe a big guy like that weighed 122 pounds, but he was a lightweight champion of the world. Here's a little show off on the beach. Next stop, Loyola on the lake, Sunnyside and Sunnyside Beach. Loyola on the lake was run by the Jesuits 
who run now Ignatius and John Carroll. They had property out there until they sold it a few years ago for the condominiums, and they had a retreat house out there for priests. But prior to that retreat house, there was this little waiting station down on the lake shore and this building. Here it is, this dashed line on the map, and up here, uh, St. Ignatius on the property, but they had this summer school building, and they would, St. Ignatius was right downtown, John Carroll University. They'd hop on a streetcar, go out to Rocky River, hop on the Lakeshore Electric, and be out here in a few minutes. And that was their retreat for the summer and teaching and everything. That burned down very early. It's a shame we lost it, but it was, it was quite a, a uh, landmark. Next up, Sandy Beach. I have nothing on that other than they called it Sandy Beach. But we do have on Vermilion on the lake. That was stop 122 and a half. And you can see it's a nice little hoof down to Vermilion on the lake. Little Bing view of the current building, which they're doing a heck of a job keeping up. Front view, this was uh, during Prohibition. It was a famous place during Prohibition. But uh, lovely log cabin. Back before the lake eroded, oops, they even had a beach. Very pretty beach with the coins out here and a sled for the kids and just a nice place to watch or go swimming. Another view of the back with the boats and swimming. Another place to dance. All along Lake Erie you had dance halls. Every place that had any kind of an area had a dance hall or a restaurant, some place for folks to get away from the city, and the Lakeshore Electric was the ideal way to do it. Hop on, for 60 cents you could go from Cleveland out to Beach Park, have a chicken dinner, dance with your latest band, Beach Park, Oak Point, Vermilion on the Lake, Ruggles Beach, dozens of them all the way out to Toledo. All available on all weather travel on the Lakeshore Electric. The infamous diagonal crossing where Liberty Avenue crosses over the Nickel Plate and the Lakeshore Electric, and then 127 Alberta Beach. The current bridge is quite a job, and you see the power poles from the Lakeshore Electric, they had to bend those around, they had to bring the road up and build this rather nice edifice. Well, that was the second one. First one looked like this. And it was a completely different design, of course, up on the, up on the piers. And this was quite historic, because this, think of how many years this lasted, because this was 1937, and they're just building it. So here's the Lakeshore Electric cruising by. They caused the bridge to be built because of all the accidents there, and they were never around when it finished, because they were gone by the time they built the bridge. Here's what it looked like. Coming this way, it wasn't too bad. You had the nickel plate and the lake shore coming this way, pretty good visibility. This way, you couldn't see anything. You were blind. You had to really sneak up and poke your nose out of that crossing to see if anybody was coming. And they had accident after accident till finally people were outraged <laughs> enough that they built the bridge. Just kept going and just kept getting uh, more and more blind, more and more blind spots, more and more accidents. Up in the air, Alberta Beach, named for the peaches down here, the dance hall and everything. That was, again, that was another hoof, but that was a place to uh, go roller skating. This aerial view, Alberta Beach is right back up here. This is the overpass, Lakeshore Electric and the nickel plate. Lakeshore Electric separated behind the shopping center, went off on its own to climb over the nickel plate, and then come back to Vermilion Road and down to the river. This is what it looks like if I sketch it in. The New York Central, the Lakeshore Electric, the nickel plate, Linwood Siding, Vermilion Road, the old road. Notice the uh, lagoons got trees and a few buildings on them. Crystal Beach is back here. Linwood Park is in the trees. We'll climb over the nickel plate. The only thing left of this is this 
abutment right back here. This piece of stonework right back here is all that's left of that. It's all been taken out, like just like this today. And here we are again, Vermilion Road. Linwood siding is, is built up now. You have the buildings here. But it looked like this in the old days. This is out taken out the window. It's a shot, the one good frame I got from a Lakeshore Electric movie. But this is crossing over the nickel plate, the New York Central, and there's Vermilion Road in the background. Another view today, crossing over. Linwood siding looked like this. Uh, it was stop 128, had a side track over here, a telephone booth to the dispatcher in Sandusky. The conductor's on the phone calling the dispatcher in Sandusky for permission to proceed, get his train orders, get out on the line. Everybody else is hoofing it down to Crystal Beach. They had a very nice two-car waiting station out there because the cars were an hour, up, an hour apart, but you could sit out there and wait. Here we are hoofing it down from that little run down from the nickel plate in Lakeshore Electric down a dirt path onto a dirt lake road to cross over for Crystal Beach. And we get to the entrance and head in. I just brought the, the very early pictures of what Crystal Beach used to look like. But the other thing that Linwood Siding was used for is when you had a charter trip. This particular trip is Western Automatic coming from Elyria. The two Lakeshore Electric cars in the front would actually go down the inurban right away from Lorraine to Elyria over through downtown, load up and come back. They had enough people to fill two cars, plus this one in the back is a little Lorraine Street Railway rapid transit car from Lorraine. They brought him along to handle the crowd. The crowds out there back in, this is Crystal Beach heyday, 1922, July 27th, National Carbon. They are going to have 800 customers on Lakeshore Electric come in from Fremont and into Crystal Beach. And at 50 some, 50 some people on a car, they have to move over the line, 11 or 12 cars in between all the other traffic, stick them on that siding, get them out of the way and back again, and then pick them up in the evening. They had also automobile parties, but that was, again, dependent on the weather. So Crystal Beach was a very, very busy place in the 20s. Started out as Shaddix Grove, a nice summer resort for those seeking pleasure. Was bought out by the Crystal Beach people, and the guy that ran it went over to run Beach Park for the Lakeshore Electric in uh, Avon Lake. The early pavilions were very nice wood, very... Uh, Small handling crowds, uh, and you know it's summer because the gals are dressed in white and enjoying a day out in the country. You can rent boats here, and they're up on the cliff because you could down on there one, and I was always surprised, <laughs> Crystal Beach, this was the beach, all the rest was hills, but you could rent a boat out there and either a, go for a ride on a motorboat or one of these and just have a great day. First dance hall was another, another small wooden building that very quickly needed replacing for a much bigger one, but that looked like this upstairs. And you had the small bands coming around, five people, and in the back is the Nickelodeon. Put a nickel in, that's a long piano roll on there for a band, and you could have a fine dance. And it was interesting, because these, these generally were a nickel a dance. And one of the folks told me how it worked out at Ruggles anyway. They had the dance floor blocked off and they had a rope. When the song was over, the guy had come out with the rope and heard you all through out the door, off the dance floor onto the side. Then you were on the other side, pay your nickel and come on for the next dance. That's how they paid the band. <laughs> also had a big water toboggan outside which was a lot of fun. A lot of, in those days, it was a very popular amusement ride. They had a concession stand, a merry-go-round, a grove of trees, and just a very pleasant way to spend the day, walk back to the inner urban and be back in town in plenty of time for the evening. This is what it looked like in, the, in 1930. 
They had a great big dance hall, all these concession stands. They call this another dance floor, but in other pictures I've seen is a casino, <laughs> back when slot machines were legal. So it was quite a place in the 30s also, and it continued up into the 60s. The automobile put a big kink in it in the Lakeshore Electric's plans because once the road got paved, the folks at Crystal Beach bought the farm across the road and made it a 25 or 2,000 car parking lot. So now we have a paved road and it's so much easier to hop in your car, shoot out the Crystal Beach and come home. So that put paid to Linwood Siding. And for a few years, they rebuilt it, moved the track around, got rid of the waiting station, still had the telephone booth to call in, but it was just nothing but pastoral country out there. And it, oh, it's overgrown now, but that's Linwood Siding today. If I was standing on Vermilion Road, where we were just looking, and looked west in 1938, this is what I would see. The Lakeshore Electric dropping down this cliff over the river into the lowlands. Where the marina is, there was bog, swamp, and bottomlands. New York Central, of course, was always there. But this is a view right into downtown Vermilion. From the U.S. Navy blimp that visited, we have these wonderful shots Rich came up with. Here's Vermilion Road looking north. The Lakeshore Electric dropping down the hill over the river, the New York Central, East River Road. Back here is our bridges we went over on the nickel plate going south into the town and the, the light plant later olive factory. But that was how Vermilion looked in the 30s from the air. Here's another air shot. This was a publicity shot for the Vermilion Lagoons. They would send this out to anybody who was interested. The most unique subdivision on the Great Lakes, beautiful homes and cottages. This was started during the Depression, before the Depression, and fizzled because nobody was building cottages during the Depression. So it sort of hung fire for a while. But in the background, again, we can see here's Vermilion Road coming down the hill, across the river, into town on Water Street, to Liberty Avenue, the Lakeshore Electric. This was right after it was built, before they did any landscaping, they just got the land built up. Here's the Lakeshore Electric coming across Water Street out on. Now this was uh, where McGarvey's ended up, and this used to be a farm. And I want you to remember if the view, if you were standing here by by the NYC over here, looking through these two bridges, you would see this farmhouse. And this is what it looked like in a postcard. This is the old New York Central Bridge, the road bridge, the Lakeshore Electric Bridge. There's the farmhouse, and there where McGarvey's is was the barn for the farm. So that, that answers that question. On that side of the river, in the bottomlands, they had a farm at the time, with the house here and the barn mail pouch is always a good sign it's a barn. The view originally looked like this when the Lakeshore came to town. This was a wagon bridge with wood block, uh, light construction built for wagons. It was heavy enough for wagons. It wasn't just a buggy bridge. The fish shed, the single track Lakeshore electric bridge coming across on Water Street. Later, the single track was converted to double track, and it was very interesting. The way these bridges are built, they're not self-supporting until they're completely built. They're all pinned together. All the beams and trusses and everything are pinned together with great big pins. You pull one of those pins and the bridge comes down. So to build this bridge, they had to drive pilings in the river and here's the old single track beams, and here's the new double track beams. So the line was still open. They had the single track going over. They had this all braced up until they could get the bridge all bolted together, and it looked like this. They had planned to extend the double track from Lorraine West. They never got the business. 
It all stayed between Cleveland and Lorraine, but they still had this real nice bridge, single track. This is looking back to Vermilion Road again. Here it is when they were scrapping the line. All the rail is up, they take it to a location point and scrap it. Now this is interesting. This is the boat called the Grandin, and that gentleman looking out the bow is Ed Lampy, and he got the contract for scrapping the bridge. But nobody told Ed about how to scrap the bridge. Pulled a pin and the bridge came down. And it came down on the Grandin. They got the bridge off and left the Grandin. It was abandoned in the river for many years, but that's how the Lakeshore Electric Bridge was taken out of Vermillion. So that's, that's one of the stories we learned that hasn't been in any other book so far. But here's the track coming across to that bridge on Water Street. The two tracks back when it was the Quonset Hut. The abutment that the bridge rested on by the, what's now the park. And the power lines telling us where the Lakeshore Electric ran. But here's the big abutment for the bridge back through the marina on up to Vermilion Road. Here's a car coming down Water Street. Heading for the station. Here he is parked in front. The semaphore signal was put up. When the semaphore is in this position, it means you got to stop. For some reason, I got a passenger, I got a package, I got something, some reason for you to stop. So the semaphore is out. Our car stopped on his way to Toledo. Here's somebody I want you to meet. He's on the list with all the Lakeshore Electric big shots. We finally tied the two together. We had the picture and we just recently got this timetable. But here you see the men in charge of the Lakeshore Electric, the president, the vice president, Mr. Cohn, Mr. Burge, Mr. Starkey, Warren Gregg, Milt Truman, Mr. Gilcher, Sandusky. We go down here, and here's a gentleman named Morris Griffin from Vermilion. He runs the station in Vermilion, and there's Morris hard at work selling tickets on the Lakeshore Electric. So he, was, he wasn't too busy in between cars. 1908, F.W. Cohen negotiates a contract for 30 arc lamps. Now, this is 30 arc lamps. If you can imagine, you know what a welding, arc welding looks like. Well, this bright light was contained in an arc, and there were 12 of them in the streets. And they would start at night at sundown. They'd turn them on from the station, and these arcs would arc in a glass tube until sunrise, throwing this bright white light all over the city. When the morning came, they'd turn the lights off, and the guy from the station would go and replace the arcs, crank the things back up, and that was your street lights in those days. But this was only for arc lamps. What they were selling at the time was not for home use, home consumption. That came later. Back when they changed over from DC to AC, from 25 cycle to 60 cycle, then they started selling power. The power got to be so good, such a big seller, 1925, they split it off into a separate company. They made literally millions of dollars selling power while the old passenger service went right down the drain. They lost their shirts. So naturally, when they had a chance, guess what they kept? Guess what they got rid of? That's why you're not running the interurbans today. But it was a good place until the paved roads again. Running into Cleveland, back and forth between Cleveland and Vermilion, you sold a lot of cottages. You could live in the west side of Cleveland, go out to your cottage in Vermilion. Your family could spend a week there. You could go out in the evening or Friday and spend the weekend with them, shoot back into town. Once the roads were paved, then they started with the automobiles in the trunks, bringing your cottage supplies in and out, back and forth by automobile, and that business went away. Here we are in the middle of winter. Ain't fun traveling except on the Lakeshore Electric. They're heated, they're nice, and they always go. Here you see a little bit of the electrical stuff in the background. This is the station. This is another one of the arc lamps that they had. This lowered down for, for changing the arc as necessary. A view back to the station. Got a rowboat out, one of Kishman's boats. Fish nets are drying and vermilion is just asleep in the summer sun. 
Here's one of Rich Terrence's grandfather's picture. These, these postcards and pictures you can always recognize. Down here is his brand, Pearl Roscoe brand. He took this picture as the Boy Scouts were at the station, ready to head west to summer camp, probably to Camp Perry. But here's all the moms and dads as they're waiting for a junior to get on board and head out for summer camp. Another train heading west. This first car is going to Detroit. It's Detroit United car. This car is probably going to Lima. But they're going to go climb up the back here because they're heading Cedar Point or Toledo for a show. Something for a one-day trip on the trains that ran every hour. In Cleveland, every night, as long as the Lakeshore Electric lasted, there was a train that left Cleveland at 8.15 in the evening. They loaded up the plain dealers for Vermilion, and they headed out to Vermilion, got there at 9.43, to the station. They parked it. Everybody got off. They parked the car. Next morning, 5.35, the car left into Cleveland for the first commuter run of the day. So they had the special commuter runs to make sure you could get to work on time if you were staying in Vermilion. And here's their total run. I don't want to go over the whole thing, but this is, this is the typical day of trains east and west bound on the Lakeshore Electric, and they all went through Vermilion. <laughs> right past the Modelton. On the dirt roads, even. This is the... Uh, Original setup, one of the 193 Brill cars on the dirt roads in Vermilion. This is the switch to the station. Another view of downtown. A lot of this is gone, but it makes this building is our cornerstone. But there's the car coming through town. This is the more modern Vermilion with Hotel Wagner still there, the brand new building on the corner that was the bank. And then the, this was, the, by the way, this was F.W. Cohen's bank that became Firelands Bank over there. So he was back there in the beginning of that also. A view past Okaji's restaurant, the movie theater, looking downtown. This is, here you can see the drop off. There's quite a hill going down there that the cars had to climb coming up. Another view, this is Grand Avenue. And at this time, Liberty Avenue ended out here in the woods and you went down Grand Avenue over by the police station and out the old dirt road. But Grand Avenue looked like this. They caught a, almost caught a car coming by, one of the water towers. But here you are zipping off the end of the road. And this is all Route, route 6 now. It used to be Route 2, zipping off the end of the road. And we're right here now. Right at that exact point is where the picture was taken. And you can see it just goes... This was a Lakeshore Electric, and it just uh, covered up the whole thing. When they rebuilt it, this was part of the construction. Edson Creek is out here, the New York Central. And this is the way you used to get out of town on the old road, back over here to dirt, out to Lake Road. This is some of the scenes of the construction. It's really changed things. But here is a picture. Now, this was taken on the second or the last fan trip, they took 166 out over the line, took a million pictures for us and one roll of film. But here she's sitting out at Bluebird Beach on the siding. If you look back, there's Edson Creek, and this is the end of Liberty Avenue. Now, let's see if I can work this. Hmm? Here we go. You did it. This is what it looked like when they were on that trip. They were meeting the westbound car. So naturally, they had to use film to take a picture of the side of the car. And all the guys getting ready to take a picture. But here she comes around the bend, Ackerman's Curve, Bluebird Beach, heading into town. Conductor got his hands out the back. He's, what am I doing? And there's the picture that same fan took. The conductor had to uh, get his hands out the, he was ready to grab that trolley rope if it came out when he was coming into town. So he was, he was always a busy guy on the Lakeshore Electric. So he's watching all the goofs take their pictures. But there's another shot of that picture. 
And this is what the curve looked like. This was Bluebird Beach back when the Lakeshore Electric was running. It's all built up, of course. This is all paved roads and, and homes. The car coming from the west, this is what it looked like. This is the railroad crossing for Lake Road going out of town. It crossed over the railroad, then went out to the lake road and headed west. But he's coming across. Car, right along the railroad, the land was flat. A little bit to the north, there were three great big gullies and fills that they wanted to avoid, so they stayed right up alongside the railroad right away coming out of town. Looked like this when they took the uh, track out, but there's our good old power poles that are there today. A little bit past there, we'll, can't quite see it, I and mean, a little bit of a hoof, but uh, Cask Villa was there at Darby Creek. And this picture, this is a nice picture because they're taken under construction. They had just assembled the barrels, got the bands on them, but no tar paper yet. They're putting the front on the cottage. But this was O'Neill's Cask Villa. It also had a nice beach. Here's a finished cottage, and they had a beautiful beach until it washed out also. Next stop is Risden Road, which was at the time was stop 134 Cutterback Road. And you see this interesting aerial view. That's what it looks like today. 1969, this is what it looked like, and this is where the Lakeshore Electric came along the railroad, cut through the fields, and out onto Risden Road right by the cemetery. There is a bridge here that's, that's gone. The, all that's left is the bottom stones and the dirt. That's all been taken out. This has all been plowed down because it wasn't, there really wasn't that much there to begin with compared to railroads. So it was no trick, but I bet you the farmers were plowing railroad spikes for a few years after they uh, took that field over. This is what it looks like today, back where it came looking, where it came out of the woods and then across. These are the original black cinders that they used to ballast the line. When they were burning coal, making their own power, they burned the cheapest coal they could get, which was mostly ashes. <laughs> So they had endless trains of gondolas going back and forth, dumping ashes on the tracks. And this killed the weeds. And then they jack it up and level it and keep the track nice and smooth. But that's, that black stuff is the original cinders from Lakeshore Electric. Next stop, 134 and a half, Orchard Beach, Vermilion Country Club now. Old Shore Inn. And this is interesting because this is, Lake Road used to run back here, right by the lake. And now it runs out in front, but that grand old building is there. Volunteer Bay, there's the Lakeshore Electric running past the different lots. The waiting station at Volunteer Bay, Rumsey Park, beautiful Rumsey Park and its station. Now this is Chapel Creek, the approach to Chapel Creek, the this, they cut all that out, but the line really had a big fill here, a big embankment coming up. And they were this high above the creek. So the, the state took this stone out, and the co other company took the rest of the fill out. But that used to be a pretty high fill there in the bridge at Chapel Creek. Beulah Beach was a stop right in front. Here's Joppa Road. They had a siding there, and here's freight. Freight car is sitting, and old 166 goes cruising by. Here's a milk platform. Farmers could deliver their packages. They would put their milk cans there, fruits, berries, groceries, anything they wanted to ship into town with a tag. They'd keep a copy of the tag. The car, either the uh, freight car would pick it up, or 166 had a compartment in the front for it, and they'd take it into town, and the farmer would get paid uh, when the Lakeshore Electric sent him his money. Here's another view. Now, here's, a, here's an easement for you. This guy got sold. There's not 10 feet between the rail and the front of that house. Now, every single Lakeshore electric car, I don't know if they blew for the crossings back then, but every single one went by that house from 1901 to 1938. Carl Reber stopped 145. Here's a paved road. Now, this is pretty good. Now, we're starting to see traffic. 
So naturally, you have cottages, you have service for the drivers, and Carl Reavers, you could have a meal at his place. German Reformed Church, there for many, many years, the Heidelberg people. There's a stop on Fraley Road at that church. Mittawanga, that place has been around for many, many years, and you can blame most of that on the Lakeshore Electric because before the Lakeshore Electric came, there was no way to get there, <laughs> except maybe a couple months out of the year. But right off the bat, they had a nice stop. Again, the milk platform, the photographer's dog, and the store. We see here again the transition, paved road, automobile, and the gas pump. But on this side of the road, the old timers are still shipping their trunks and packages on the Lakeshore Electric, just barely see the track here, because it was so much easier. That later became Ward's Lakeshore Ripples. The early advertisements for Mittawanga Beach, bathing, golf, dancing, Wild Waves Dining Room, believe it or not, was a famous dining room. Uh, and I'm, I mean, it was known statewide as a place to have a good meal. Looked like this, and it grew to be so good, they put an extension on the back, and that was kept full. It also was used as a stopping point for other interurban lines. The Green Line that ran through Berlin Heights had a great program where every summer they would take people along the right away, their customers, their business people that they wished, of course, they were generating traffic, they would take them on a circle trip and they would go to Toledo, they would go to Akron, because all the interurbans were connected. And they'd take this great big car, this was, their, this was their pride and joy, the parlor car with the big fancy seats, and they'd take 50 or 60 people around all over the, all over the state, <coughs> literally, and one of the places they loved to stop, they had stopped the wild waves for dinner. Pull the car over on the side, have dinner, and then take everybody home. Big green and urban car. More paved roads. This was before Route 2 washed out. It was right literally on and in the lake. Ruggles Beach, the big dance hall there, was very popular. Here's one of the stamps from the station. This was the back of a ticket from the uh, Ruggles Beach Station. Inside the pavilion was a standard summer only situation. Had a concession stand, a piano when the band didn't show up. And when the band did show up, you generally had a good crowd. But imagine now, this is out in the middle of a fairly well unpopulated area, available again by the Lakeshore <laughs> Electric. Also had a beautiful beach for the summer, summer swimming. Cranberry Creek, uh, the abutments. This is Han Road, and for some reason they never stopped at Han Road. But it's interesting because not only are the Lakeshore Electric abutments, they're not here anymore, but they were a couple years ago. But here is the stump of the Lakeshore Electric chestnut pole. This was before creosote and stuff like that. Lots of chestnut available, and it just didn't rot. But here's the genuine Lakeshore Electric pole and the abutments. Next stop out, when Lake Road washed out west of Mittawanga, they moved the road south all the way to Huron, and all of a sudden it became very dangerous because now the Lakeshore Electric crossed the road instead of going parallel. And this is what the drivers faced, and this is what my dad told me. He said driving out to, driving, he loved his Model A, driving out to Cedar Point, you had to be very careful at these crossings because he's coming across and I'm sure they slowed down, but it's a fairly blind angled crossing. So they had to, the state had them put flashers in, which was a good idea. But here's the old Lake Road going to the edge of Sealand and the new one going to the south side of the lagoons at Huron where the condominiums are. So here's that crossing from the uh, road point of view. Pretty, go, pretty close to the end of our trip, this is what that all looks like today. There's the Lakeshore Electric, and here's Old Lake Road and New Lake Road. 
No sign of any problems at all. Nice wide road, a nice new road. Well, it all ended May 15th, 1938, when the inner urbans quit. Let's see if we get this to do what we want it to do now. Yep. Well, this has a mind of its own. Hang, hang on a minute. Here we go. See that? Bam. That's your people catcher at work. Here's another example. That's how a people catcher worked in the city. <laughs> now, this, I just have one more thing I want to show you if we can get to it. Here we go. This is leaving Sandusky down Columbus Avenue. We got to stay in the speed limit. Make it big again. Oh, you broke it. Wrong button. <laughs> we'll go. take all 174 that we saw. We'll take that through the countryside. <laughs> Up over Slate Cut over the railroad. Now we're out at Barnes Nursery on Lake Road. Right across the street from Barnes House, we went over the railroad, over the roller coaster. And into the sunset for the end of the Lakeshore Electric. And I thank you, folks.